Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome to a new episode of Church Board Confessions, episode 132. I'm your host, Emanuele Hecke, and you know what I'm saying? We're in a very different location here. We're not in the hot room today. I told you guys we're going to switch it up every now and then, and I felt like it was the perfect time to do so when we are what? <laughs> Five days, five days away from the unassociated poetry jam, and here I am. You know, I'm in, I'm in the place where it's gonna happen, ladies and gentlemen. I'm in my church, Redeeming Grace Christian Center. Um, in five days, we are going to be hosting the unassociated poetry jam for from this stage where I'm at right now. I only thought it was right. I'm very excited. I'm so excited for this jam. And I'm going to tell you something. It has been a journey. It has truly been a journey doing, like, planning and and, and going through everything with this, I will say. And God has taught me a lot through it. And I'm so excited for this to finally happen because, like, I don't think you guys understand that. I don't know if you've been to a poetry jam before or, or slam jam, wham bam, whatever. But, like... When I tell you that you are going to feel something different with this show and it's hard for me to put in words and it's really something that you actually have to experience. I'm so excited. We are going to be streaming live www.un-associated.com slash T-U-P-J-4 www.un-associated.com slash T-U-P-J-4. You must, you must, you must tune in. There's no excuse. If your country has YouTube, I expect to see you tuning in. Oh, I'm so excited. I'm so excited, guys, for real. So here I am, you know, I'm on stage, you know, and uh, let's get to this episode, shall we? Today, I wanted to talk about something that I think is when you understand something like this, it takes your relationship with God to the next level. And the reason why I would even make such a claim like that, a big claim like that, is because I've seen it happen in my life, ladies and gentlemen. There has been a recurring message in my life that has been telling me that the problems that I am facing, the problems that I am experiencing, right, they are molding me to be something better. And you hear that, you hear that all the time, and, you know, it doesn't really make you feel better when a lot of people say that, what doesn't kill you, make you stronger. Well, at the same time, we don't want to suffer, don't we? But, man, I tell you, this time last year, literally this time last year, I was in my room, and I was contemplating. I'm doing unassociated, I'm doing this ministry, you know, what what else, you know, am I supposed to be doing next in my life? Do I go and do I seek a career in whatever I'm going to seek a career in, right? Do I start my professional career, right? Or if I know that God has called me to preach, shouldn't I go to seminary school? Because I feel like seminary school will equip me with more, you know, education and knowledge that's really going to be effective in my ministry, you know? This this literally, what I always knew that if I was ever going to go into preaching, like for real, then I had to, then I personally made the goal of wanting to go to seminary, right? So what do I do? Do I go to seminary or do I go to uh, get a professional career or, you know, because how I can't possibly juggle all three. You think I'm playing? Look, (laughs) this is my journal, right? This is my journal means a lot to me. I journal virtually every day. And I don't know if you can see this it's going to get blurry, but January 18, 2021, I wrote this. Let me make sure it's the right one. January 18, 2000, 2021. If, you, if you're listening to this, real quick, go to YouTube and look at this, right? Um, I can subscribe. I'm playing. <laughs> January 18, 2021. I wrote this. I drew this, actually. And basically, it was literally what was going on in my head, contemplating, what do I do? Do I get a job and start a career and it has money signs next to it? Or do I... Do you know, do I go to seminary school and then on unassociated is in the middle and then it reads this one isn't going anywhere. Unassociated isn't going anywhere. That's the ministry. Right. So which one do I do? 
And then I drew a crossroads. I'm sorry, not a crossroads, a fork in the road. One, one, one side says ministry, one side says money, right? This is, this is what I was contemplating. And a year later, January 22nd, 2000, I'm sorry, it's not 22nd, <laughs> but I'm recording on the 22nd. Oh, what is it going to be? January 20, January 23rd, 2022, here I am, ladies and gentlemen. I'm doing all three. I'm doing all three. Glory be to God. You know, there's the resolve. I'm doing all three, but I'll tell you this, that it is hard. Life has been hard. Life has been challenging. You know, it, it's, 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 it's been challenging. <laughs> uh, juggling all three has been a hardship. There have been times where I felt very overwhelmed, times where I felt like, what is going on? Times where I felt very low trying to juggle all three. And I started thinking to myself, man, how on earth am I going to get through this for the next four years? Yes, seminary is going to take me four years. This is hard. And I had this conversation with God before I entered in 2022, and God gave me a response. And he gave me the place that we read. I think it was Matthew, yeah, Matthew 16. I read it the past couple of weeks. But ultimately, what God was telling me was that this was Emmanuel's cross to bear. This is your challenge. This is your cross to bear. And you know what Jesus says, that if any man wants to follow him, he has to deny himself, take up his cross and follow him. Hmm. And God told me that this is my cross to bear. There's no way around it. I have to have a career. I have to make money in order to feed my, you know, not, well, I guess I'm not the head honcho in my family, but to take care of my, you know, family in certain ways and also prepare for the family that I want to start in the near future. You know, ministry on the social isn't going anywhere. We tend toes. Seminary, you know, sure, you can make the argument that you don't have to go to seminary to be a pastor, but you kind of have to go. No, I'm not going to go there. But not like, but at the same time, I've already seen the impact that seminary has had in my life and in my ministry and, and how I can teach and how I can be knowledgeable on certain things. This is my cross to bear. And it got me thinking, you know. It got me thinking about, you know, maybe I'll write a book. <laughs> and the title to that book, I'm not actually writing a book, but the title to that book would be The Sometimes Unpleasant Life of a Christian. Because we all, we all thought that, you know, well, not all of us, but a lot of us thought that, you know, this Christian thing was going to be a cakewalk. Everything was going to be cool. We're going to be happy all the time because God's going to be blessing us all the time. And there is definitely truth to that because we have joy. We have access to Jesus' peace that he says he left us. And I believe John chapter, 20, about chapter 14, verse 27, the peace that I leave with you is not of this world, right? We always have access to peace. We have access to joy. But that doesn't mean that everything in our life is going to be peaceful. It does not mean that everything in our life is going to be joyous. We have access to these things because of Jesus Christ. We're able to feel these things because of Jesus Christ. That's why. Because your life is going to be very unpleasant sometimes as a Christian. In fact, it's been assured that it will be unpleasant sometimes. How do I know that God is going to allow hardships and tribulation to, to meet you? How do I know that he's going to discipline you? Because the word of God says it. And that's when, that's when our lives are the most unpleasant, I think. Our lives are most unpleasant when God allows the hardships, allows the temptations, allows the trials. It's hard when God disciplines us, chastises us. John 16, says, you will have temptation, right? Jesus says, you will have temptation. I'm sorry, you will have tribulation, but it's okay. I've overcome the world. In Matthew 4, 1 we see that the Holy Spirit is who led Jesus into the wilderness in order to be tempted of the devil. Hmm. God allows and sometimes even facilitates the trials and temptations and hardships. Hmm. What type of God is that? Quick disclaimer. I don't want you to go running to say, see, I fell into temptation. It's God's fault. No, no, no. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, I'll read this one. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. That's the scripture. So don't, don't go saying, Emmanuel said, it's God's fault that I'm tempted, so that's why if I fall into temptation, it's okay. No, the scripture says no. If you fall into temptation, that's your fault. God disciplines us too. 
Hebrews 12, 6, because the Lord disciplines the ones he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. That's what the word of God says. So through these verses and other many other verses you can use, we know that God allows hardships and sometimes facilitates trials and tribulations and temptations. And he also chastises us, disciplines us. And I personally think that this kind of encompasses all of the unpleasantness in being a Christian. Well, not all of it, but, you know, that's the two I'm going to talk about today. Let's talk about the hardships of life and the discipline of God in life. I'll be the first one to tell you these things are not fun, ladies and gentlemen. In fact, the Bible will tell you that it's not fun. At least we see in the case of discipline, Hebrews 12, 11 clearly says that no one enjoys discipline. Discipline is not something that feels good. It actually feels very unpleasant in the moment. So with that being said, what is our hope in these times? What are we supposed to hope for? A lot of us, we hope that it comes to an end. All of the trials, tribulations, all of the discipline that it comes to an end because it's hard. You know, like sometimes I just want it. So then I've already graduated from seminary school. I want it so I have a whole bunch of money so I don't have to work anymore. I want it so that I don't know. Just that all these afflictions, how you're feeling, how you've been enduring, that all of it just stops. All of the problems stop. That's what we hope for because it stresses us out. And we, and we stress out and we pray. And the reality is that sometimes God is not going to answer that prayer because you guys are not on the same page. You are trying to pray away that problem while God is trying to use that problem for something. But what is that something? I personally believe that that something is making you better, working on you, like you prayed he would. But let's keep that there. We're going to go to Psalm 23 and we're going to all we're going to link it all together. All right. Psalm 23 is probably the most popular place in the entire Bible. It's probably the first place you ever heard from the entire Bible. You know, maybe that in John 316. Some people will be able to recite this without even reading it. I'm not one of those people, believe it or not. So I'm going to go ahead and read it. Psalm 23. <laughs> it says, the Lord is my shepherd. And scholars believe that this is David that wrote this. The Lord is my shepherd, King David. <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Excuse me. And thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. May God bless the hearing and the reading of his, and understanding of his word in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's get to it. So, you know, I was reading this, and, you know, this time a couple things stood out to me. But before I get to the thing that really stood out to me, let's talk about what it means for God to be our shepherd. The scripture says the Lord is our shepherd. It's commonly used to, to describe God in the Old Testament. It's commonly used to describe Jesus in, in the New Testament. Well, the father in the Old Testament, Yahweh, and then the son in the New Testament. Let me say that more clear. All right. So we see it says that the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Does that mean we never want anything? Well, that's not really realistic. Don't we want stuff? I'm sure David wrote one of his stuff, right? So what do you mean by that? Other versions will say that I lack nothing. What this saying is doing is highlighting God as a provider. I have everything I need because God is my shepherd. God being our shepherd means that he is our provider. He's going to make sure we're good. He's going to make sure we have everything we need. He's going to make sure that we are sufficient in all things. It says he lies us down in green pastures, leads us beside still waters, restores our soul. To me, that sounds like God 
being our shepherd, is the catalyst of our peace. He's the catalyst of our rest. He's the one that leads us there. He's the one that places us there. He's the reason why we can have it. It says, he leads us in a path of righteousness for his name's sake. He makes us holy. He makes us righteous. He's leading us in a path of life that is going to make us more righteous. Verse 4. It stood out to me. My dad was preaching on this. It says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Hmm. The valley of the shadow of death. Rappers love to reference this. I don't know what the obsession is, but like there are so many songs that reference the valley of the shadow of death. Valley, shadow, death. It just sounds like not a place where you want to spend your vacation. I think we can all agree, right? A place of trials and tribulation, a place of temptations, a place of sorrow, a place of suffering. Hmm. And there was a thing that my dad said, and I think it's evident in our lives that we live. You know, a lot of times we find ourselves in the valley of shadow of death. And, you know, a lot of times it's because of our own sin. We sinned. We got into a really sticky situation. Other times it wasn't because we did anything wrong. It was sometimes. God is the one holding our hand and leading us into the valley of the shadow of death. Believe it or not. That's what my dad said. Hmm. How dare he, right? How dare, how dare our father lead us to the valley of the shadow of death when we trust him? Why would he do that? What's his goal? I think I know his goal. Does that mean that I always like it when I'm in the valley of the shadow of death? Not at all, but I think I do know his goal. I think I know his goal, and his goal is to make us more like Christ. That's what I believe his goal is, literally to make us better. In James chapter 1, starting at verse 3, it says, Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature, complete, not lacking anything. I genuinely think, and if you read even the, um, the previous verses, it's talking about trials and tribulations and how we should count it all joy. Um, and basically what the scripture says is that we should be joyous when we have these trials and tribulations because they're essentially when it finishes its work is going to make us mature complete not lacking anything it's going to make us more righteous going to make us mature it's going to make us complete it's going to make us like jesus that's god's goal isn't it funny how we can have all these goals in life right we want to be the president we want to be the star quarterback we want to be the movie star we want to be the rich guy. We want to be the mogul. We want to be all these different things. You want to know what God's goal is? Maybe, yeah, he can have you be those things. But before any of that, his goal is to make you more like Christ. And I feel like when you don't understand that, there's a big disconnection that's going to go on there. A big disconnection. Because you're going to be saying, I'm going through these trials and tribulations, and I am not closer to my goal of being famous and rich while God is saying, but if you would just allow me to do what I'm doing, I'm making you more like Jesus. Don't you see yourself bearing the fruits of the spirit? Don't you see yourself in situations where you can now help other people in their situations? Don't you see yourself becoming more patient, becoming more kind, becoming more faithful, becoming more dependent on me? But our goal is on being prosperous in this world. We got to get on the same page. The reality is that through the suffering and the stress and the trials and the tribulations and the temptations and the discipline, all these things that seem very unpleasant, they, with the power of God, genuinely make us better. And it's not crazy to, to understand this. This is, not, this is not a new idea that none of us have ever heard before because we recognize this idea all throughout life, don't we? I mean, come on, you go to the gym and you stress out your muscles. Why do you stress out your muscles in the gym? To make them better. 
You go to practice for your sport and you stress your body. Why do you stress your body? To make yourself perform better. You go to school and you stress your life. I mean, you stress your brain. <laughs> Why do you do that? You do that to make yourself better, to make yourself more knowledgeable, a better version of yourself. So why is it so weird for us to understand that we go through these trials and tribulations in life and they stress our lives, they stress our bodies, they stress our minds, they stress our souls so they can make our bodies, our minds, our souls Better, more like Jesus. The trials make us better. The discipline makes us better. Hebrews chapter 12, 11, I'll, I'll read it again. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. I've given you scripture that tells you that the trials and tribulations, the temptations of this world, they can literally make you better through God's power, right? I read to you how the, the discipline, God's discipline on our lives, it makes us better, right? He Hebrews 12, 11. So I have a question for you, because a lot of times we get to the point where we are tempted we are facing trials. We are facing hardships. We are facing God's chastisement, his discipline. And we think that God hates us. We think that God is super mad at us. We think that God wants nothing to do with us. And that's why we are suffering. But the scripture says that it is these things that God uses to make us more like Christ, to make us better people, better children, better beings. So I have a question for you. Think about the person that genuinely wants you to be better in life. And I hope you have that person. If you don't, just imagine it. The person that genuinely wants you to be better in life, is that the person that hates you? And I want you to wait. I want you to, if you need to pause it, I want you to think about that. I, I really want you to unpack that. Because when we get to these points in life, these unpleasant times of life, we think that we're, me and God beefing. Me and God are, oh, no, nah, see, no. I would say that there's evidence in the scripture that it's when we are in these unpleasant times of life, it only actually shows that God is near and he loves us because He's trying to mold us and he's trying to make us better and he's trying to fix us and he's trying to piece us together. And this is the path that he's using. And don't be that person that acts like you haven't become better through any of the trials and tribulations. And like I said, I know maybe there's some of this stuff that I, I, I can't explain why God has allowed every single bad thing in your life to happen. And I pray that you have the Holy Spirit to help you navigate what does this apply to and what does it not apply to? Like, is there some stuff that are bad happening and God wants me to learn from it? Some stuff that are happening and maybe it's just some stuff that are bad things that are happening because of sin or bad things that are happening for a reason that you probably will never know. So I ask the Holy Spirit to guide you in this. Because I don't want to say that God's trying to teach you something. That's why, you know, so, so, and so died or that's why so, so, and so, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I, I recognize that there's a lot of people that, you know, have said stuff like that. But I, I want to I want you to know that I, I don't know why God has allowed every single bad thing in your life to have happened. I, Emmanuel Hecate, does not have the answer. I don't think that there should be a blanket answer. That is my opinion. Well, what I can tell you is I've seen the evidence in my life and the life of many other people that it is, it is some unpleasant times in life that God has actually used and even facilitated in order to make us better. So it's in these times we should not be mistaken and think to ourselves that God doesn't like us. It's in these times we need to hunker down, double down, and recognize the love of God through the trials and tribulations. Is in these times we need to hunker down and recognize the love of God through the discipline. So let's talk about 
recognizing God's love through the trials. All right. I think the way to recognize God's love through the trials is to constantly remind yourself that he is with you, that he loves you, and that he is helping you. There's a million verses for this, but I'm going to read Isaiah 43, verse 2. You can read Romans 8, I believe 38, 39. You can read Isaiah 41, 10. Uh, What else can you read? There's a lot of places. This one says, this is God speaking to the children of Israel. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you pa- when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. I need you to understand that in those trials and tribulations, what I want to be running through your head constantly is that God is not simply a spectator. He's not just simply there to, to, to watch you suffer. He plays a very active role, ladies and gentlemen. And we know that because of Scripture. And we know that because if we actually take the time to locate God in those times, you'd realize that not only is he right beside us, he's also right in front of us, leading us through the way. He's the person that's not letting our trials overflow us. He's the person that's, that's not, that, that, that is holding our hand, being with us through it all. He's the person with the grace that's keeping us because his grace is sufficient. He's literally the person that is literally helping you. That is the God we serve. And I know it doesn't feel like that sometimes. And I, and I pray that in those times that you feel God, I'm praying that in those times that you take the time to acknowledge him that you slow it down, and that you see him. How do we recognize God's love through the discipline? Honestly, I probably have to do a... Well, Kendra did a, did a great episode on, on this, um, her last episode, episode 87. Definitely check that out. Towards the end, she started talking about discipline. It's part of the reason why I wanted to talk about it today. It really inspired me. How do we recognize God's love through the discipline? I'm going to read Proverbs 11. I'm sorry, Proverbs 3. Verse 11 and 12, and this is also a place that's quoted in Hebrews 12, verse 5 and 6. And it says, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his his rebuke, because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. The Lord disciplines those he loves. The Lord disciplines those he loves the lord disciplines those he loves that is what the word of god says and i got i started thinking i started thinking psalm 23 is what we read from right and verse 4 was it verse 4 yes at the end of verse 4 it says thy rod and thy staff comfort me david said that god's rod who is his shepherd the shepherd's rod and staff Comfort him. So I started thinking to myself, hmm, a rod and a staff. If I'm not mistaken, (laughs) you know, there's reasons why the shepherds use the rod and the staff. You know, they have the staff to help them walk on, like, you know, balance on, like, the rocky terrain that they walk up and stuff like that. But in relation to the sheep, the rod and the staff, it has a real use, right? It's what they use to poke and pull the sheep Whenever one of them, you know, sheep are dumb. One of them strays away. One of them tries to do their own thing. One of them gets themselves into trouble or wanders off into trouble. The shepherd will use the staff to poke it and pull it by its neck. If you've ever been poked and pulled by your neck, you know that that doesn't seem nice. It does not feel good. Just like the discipline of God does not feel good. But David writes in Psalms 23, verse 4, that it is the rod and the staff of the shepherd that comfort him. So then it got me thinking. A lot of us, we think that God hates us in the time when we're facing his discipline. But David says that that discipline is what comforts him. And and the scripture teaches that, that God disciplines those that he's loved. So maybe 
The discipline of God is never meant to be communicating that he hates us, but instead, there are two things that the discipline of God actually communicates. One, it is that God is with us. He is still with us. Because somebody's doing the poking and pulling. And it communicates that God loves us. That is what you should understand. That is what you should receive. That is what's being communicated. The next time you face the discipline of the Lord, remember what it is communicating to you. It is not communicating that God hates you. In fact, it is the quite, quite the opposite. It is communicating that God loves you. It is communicating that God is still with you. That's what it's communicating with. Because, look, if he didn't like you anymore, he would have left you and he would have forsaken you. The sheep that the shepherd don't want wanders off into trouble. Why would the shepherd run after it? Why, why on earth would the shepherd go and try to pull it and poke it back in line? Does that make any sense? It doesn't. So I hope from this talk you understand that those unpleasant times of life are truly the times where we can recognize God's love. The trials, the tribulations, he's trying to make you better. The discipline, he's trying to make you better. Don't hate these times. I know they're hard. I know they're tough. And they're going to be hard. They're going to be tough. Hearing this is not going to make them not hurt as much technically like you know it's still gonna feel you're still gonna feel feel it right but it does give you access to a level of joy and and um a knowledge of god's love in those times and maybe i'll say i'll scratch that i think it does make it better because it makes you stronger and it makes you have more endurance forbearance that's a new word that i learned forbearance yeah Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for this word. Thank you so much for your goodness. And I pray, Lord, that it truly seeps into the brains of everyone that is listening. Excuse me. I pray that you help them to grab it and, and hold on to it and understand it. Don't just end it here. Continue to speak to them, Father God, in this matter. Helping them to, to recognize your love in the places where they thought you hated them. In the mighty name of Jesus, Father, bless them, uphold them, lift them up, O oh God. Help them to be better. Help them to be more like Christ. And as they're going through the trials and tribulations and the discipline that it takes to be more like Christ, help them to have peace. Help them to have joy. Help them to have their hope in you and to be dependent in you, Father. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Five days, ladies and gentlemen. Five. Five days. Five days. I'm not going to say I'll see you next week. I'm going to say I'm going to see you in five days. Saturday, 7 p.m. Pacific Time, the Unassociated Poetry Jam 4. I will see you there. Love y'all. Peace.